for that first part. So you guys would have a tutorial or a video lesson that you could kind of reference back to if you needed it. So I'm going to start recording at least to get capture the second part. So um, we showed the area light. And remember, kind of start out with the skydome light. Um, you can bring in an area light and start to kind of um, form your scene. You can kind of see back here, hopefully, why I created a psych so that the that back wall wouldn't be distracting because we just kind of like, at least for the scene, I want my focus to be on the, the objects. And the more you get into modeling and rendering, like when you're making like character models and like these advanced things where you just spend all this work modeling and texturing these characters, um, those psychs become really helpful just so that it's, that background's not a distraction, it's not messing things up, you know, and people are able to kind of focus on your real creations here. Um, so, the next thing I want to talk about is um, I kind of began to introduce color because I showed in an area light, you can kind of change the color. So you can kind of um, use that as one way to kind of alter the color of your scene. But, you know, that's just the the light source. It's like if you put a pink piece of, piece of plastic in front of your, your flashlight, you know, that's what you get right here. But if you want your objects to appear like a different color and um, as different things, um, there's another process we should do. And that's going to bring us back to the hypershade window. So um, let me close that out. And while we're in the background, I'll just snapshot that. Oops. OK. So this is our scene right as, as we have it. Um, remember, I have my, rent, my Arnold render view, which again is Arnold render right there, going through the camera right there. And then I set my actual view where I move the camera or my perspective around as the perspective view. And this is pretty helpful because my camera stays is staying locked right here, you know. So I'm able to kind of work on my render, but I have freedom to reposition my perspective um, without having to worry about like finding a new composition to render every single time I kind of mess with, you know, some aspect of this. Um, and uh, one question that came up, which I'm super glad was asked here, was um, uh, when you're rendering, there's these buttons up here. And some of these buttons are really helpful right here. But like this button, for instance, right here is um, uh, still works. And this is a, a, a good render view to use right here. But um, this is a little bit of more of like a an old school render view because basically what happened with Maya is they had what they called uh, ray tracing renders, and that's where these lights right here come from. Create lights, and these lights right here are called ray tracing lights. And this render view is kind of from that era right there. And then um, Maya added Arnold, which is like a third party developer, to um, who focused on rendering and lighting. And so that's why there's this menu right here called Arnold, where we see like this render and these lights and these shaders come in. So that's kind of where that name comes from. And so sometimes in Maya, you'll see um, something like create a light and you'll see one of these lights and you'll think, oh, it's a light, let's create it. But it's, it's from a, you know, some, it's from an older era right, right there. So um, Maya's filled with like these kind of arbitrary hurdles that are just kind of seem to just be there to trip people up. So apologies for that. But if you stay in the Arnold menu, that's, that's usually pretty safe when you're creating lights and renders right here. Um, and this render view right here, which again, oops, which can be kind of found in some of these buttons right here, can still really be helpful. And I, I, um, I actually end up using them a lot anyway. But again, the Arnold render view kind of renders in real time, which is really nice. And there's some nice advantages to it. Um, so one thing that I've been um there's two ways to get to the hypershade um right so sorry for the sidetrack so we're getting back to how to ch change the materials and the colors of these objects right here to different things and so there's two ways to get to the menu the first way is the way i've been doing it which is you go to windows rendering editors and then down to hypershade right here but if you look at this button right here you see how there's that little um i don't know how to describe it, it looks like a little olive um right there so um, a spherical, a greenish blue object with a white circle inside of it right there. If you look up here, this is the same uh, icon right there. So you can get to the hypershade window um, by going through that menu. 
um, under Windows um, Rendering Editor and finding the hypershade, but you can also just press this button right here that looks, um, if I I'll hold my cursor over and it says hypershade right there, um, the green spherical object with the white circle on it, and that'll bring us right to the hypershade menu. Um, so that can be a helpful little shortcut right there to get to it. So um, right now, looking at the hypershade, and we kind of talked about this before a little bit, is we have the main material, which I created right here. Um, I'm having trouble with, there we go. Um, and we start with the Lambert. I made um, an Arnold uh, standard surface shader down here um, under Arnold shader, and then went to this one right here to create what I called uh, main two right there. And I didn't change really anything about this material right here. Um, it's just kind of, it starts off as like a white plasticky material. So over here is where you can kind of change that material's attributes right here. And the, if you remember, I selected all of my objects and then I went to or right clicked right here on the material and said assign material to selection. And that's how um, all these objects got that white plasticky material to come uh, to be on them there. And um, let's see here. If I want, for instance, one of like one of these cubes to be red instead of white, I'll have to make a new material right here and kind of go from there, if that makes sense. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to rename this white one just for since it's a white material and name it right there. But if I were to um, go down here into the attributes and change the color of it, for instance, to um, uh, a pink color, um, all the objects in my scene change to a pink color because I applied that material to all of them right there, right? So let's say, for instance, that I want all these materials to be just a plain old, plain Jane white right here. And I'm just going to clear, clear out my node view so it's not distracting me by pressing this little star button right there. And it doesn't delete anything again. It just kind of moves it out of the way. So I'll go under Arnold, Shader, and then look for AI standard surface right here. I'm just going to make another one right here. And I'll rename it um, pink one. And I'll change the material to um, this kind of pinkish color. I won't make it all the way saturated. So I'm kind of, you remember right here, um, these sliders right here, you can kind of make it all the way saturated down to an off-white. So, um, and then these are our hues right here. And then this is the darkness and brightness. So you can kind of dial in your colors just using those three sliders right there. And right now on the render, I created that material, but it's not on anything. So let's say that I want the donut to be pink and nothing else. All you need to do, this is super intuitive, is you just select the donut in object mode, and then you right click on where um, the pink material, remember the materials that we've created in our scene show up here. So I just right click right here and go to the top to assign material to selection because it's, it's gonna assign the material to the object that's selected, which right now is just the donut. So assign material to selected. And so you can see it in my preview right there that everything is kind of a gray and then there's the, the pink donut right there. And now when I go to my updated render view, I have um, everything's a plain white and then I have the one donut that is um, a pink color right there. And it's kind of a shiny plastic material by default with um, the AI standard surface. So you can kind of see that that pink is reflecting, um, or the light is bouncing, I should say, off of the donut and kind of hitting the certain area right here. So you can kind of see how um, these materials start to interact with one another. So. I'll just go ahead and um, I'll kind of, just for fun, I'll, I'll make another one here as well, just to kind of show that process one more time. So I'll minimize my render view and uh, down here in the hypershade, and remember the hypershade is this button right here, is um, I'll go down to under Arnold shader, scroll down, look for AI standard surface right here. Um, before I click on it, I'm just going to clear out my old one just so it doesn't, so because they'll start to stack on top of each other and just get a little 
claustrophobic in there. Let's see. So I'll go AI standard surface right here to make a third one. And I can rename it by right clicking and going to rename up here or just with it selected. So it's highlighted yellow right there. I can just name this blue. I'm going to make it blue. So I'll just name it blue one. And notice that I name these. I always do like pink one, white one, blue one. I give it a number because it might not be your only blue object in the scene, right? So you might end up with a second blue that's more of a cyan and you might make that blue two or something like that. And it just gives you some room to maneuver because you'll start to see when you build a scene, this, this window is going to fill up real quick on you. And if there, if these things aren't named, it's going to get real ugly. So um, I always say it and no one ever listens, but um, try, try to rename this as it goes along and I'll kind of make this a little more easy to manage once you get to the later stages of your project. So I have blue one selected right there. I'll click on color and I'll make this blue just by coming in here. And once I have it in a place that I like it, I'll just go ahead and I'll just hold shift and I'll select these three objects right here. So my cube with the beveled edges, my cube with no beveled edges, and then my uh, platonic solid right there. And right here where it says blue, to make these objects blue, I just um, right here, I right click and go to assign material to selected. So it's a right click and assign material to selected. And you can see it updates right there. And in the render view, it should automatically update right there for me. And so you can see the scene is starting to kind of um, come together right there. And I'm going to go for the last color. So I feel like the floor being white like this looks a little weird with these other kind of more saturated colors next to it. So I'm just going to um, make one more material and make it a different color here. And hopefully it'll come to me when I'm doing it here. So one more. Let's see. So make sure not to go under the Maya menu when you're making a shader, just go under Arnold, Arnold shader right here. So I click right there and then it's AI standard surface, which is right here. You can see how they start to stack on top of each other kind of annoyingly. So um, I can just click on the old blue one and then press the clear button. And I have my new one right here, which I haven't named yet. And if I press the double play button, it'll come up right there. Um, I... I'll try to do cyan or something. Um, and again, same thing. I'm just choosing different colors right here. Um, and do something a little lighter. OK. So in, a, to, in order to apply the cyan color to the floor, again, I'm just clicking on the floor, right clicking, and going assign material to selected right here. And so you can see how that material gets applied. This is going to be a very like overly colorful situation right here. Um, and so you can see right here, I don't really love those colors, but it's okay. We're going to kind of keep moving through this because I want to show you how to give these um, materials different attributes right here. So um, one thing about a psych normally, you know, that curved surface that we're making, like typically in photography, people most of the time aren't using like a really glossy material. So we might want to make this a little less glossy of a material. So that's something that might come up in a moment here. Also, just because I'm just like this, I want to change my lighting a little bit because I was working when the objects were white, but I don't like it as much in this situation. So I'm going to change the spread to be something a little broader. A little more intensity. So when you're lighting and rendering scenes, this is going to come up a lot where you're just kind of messing with things and trying to find what works when messing with them here. OK, I'm not going to get too far into this. So um, there's a couple different ways that we can change these materials. And so there's one that's really fun right here, which is um, Arnold, uh, the Arnold AI standard surface has some really good presets in there. So Hypothetically, um, if you wanted your material to be um, like a chrome object, for instance, let's let's do that one first. So um, I'll go into the hypershade here and pull it up. And 
I press clear to get that out of the way. So again, I'm under the, I'm doing the same thing again, again, it's just Arnold shader, and then I'll do the AI standard surface this time. And so I have a new one here. You, are you starting to see why it's helpful to name these things? If I didn't name them, I would have AI standard surface one, two, three, four, five, and six, and there's no visual indicator on them right here, other than your, the name that you give it right here. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to rename this one Chrome. One, okay. And right here, this is super easy. So um, this is a fun thing right here. So under here, we have all these attributes that we can change. So I could manually change these sliders right here, which go into all these submenus to change materials. And that's gonna, you're gonna start to do that once you start kind of creating detailed characters and detailed scenes. But a lot of times when you're first building, there's this presets button right here um, that can be really helpful. So I just made a, a new AI standard surface the exact same way I have in the past. I make sure that it is selected. I, I named it Chrome right here. And if you go up here to this presets button, if you, you have to click it and you have to hold it, but you'll see this menu come up. Let me drag this to a different position. So this presets button is right here next to the name of it. You have to um, click it and hold it. And you can see right here, there's a bunch of different presets that you can choose from in here. So you can see right here, I have a Chrome. And I can go to replace, and which is most of the time what you're going to want to do is you're just going to choose a preset and then replace and then start from there. Um, but you can, if you want, what these blends mean is, right, so right now it's a white plastic. You can see in this little preview right there that it's going to be a white plastic. So if I did um, Chrome and then blend by 25%, it's going to be 25% Chrome and then 75% white plastic material. It kind of like finds the average between those. Most of the time, you're not going to want to do that. You're just going to want to replace it. So I'll just press replace. And you can see we have a Chrome material right here. And you're going to want to, you, a lot of the times, you're going to want to go in and make adjustments to it. And that's where some of these sliders come in and all these different areas. And we're going to go into that as this class goes along. But this is really helpful because you can just start with the preset right here to get a lot of this stuff done. So let me change my scene back. So I'm just going to select my whole scene. And I'm just going to add my white material right here to it, back to it. And then on the donut, I'm just going to go to my Chrome material. So I selected my donut in the object mode and find my Chrome material, right click, and then assign material to selection. You can see that it, it appears black right here, as highly reflective objects often do right here. And you can see that we have like a totally um, Chrome object showing up in the render right there. And um, depending on the sky dome light that you have, the Chrome, you know, like a reflective object is going to look drastically different right here. So, you know, I have a studio. Uh, and also keep in mind, Chrome is like 100% reflective. It's like ultra reflective, you know? So if you look at that and you're like, that's, that's a bit much, you know, in terms of the reflectivity. Um, I can go into the preset. So I'm selecting Chrome right here. And then I'm going into the preset material. And you can try some of these other ones to use as a starting point. So we have copper, for instance. So I could try copper right there. And I might need to rename it just by on the Chrome. I'll right click, rename, and put copper in here. And so you can see we have, we now have a copper object right here. Um, and you can really start to kind of um, build interesting scenes this way. Um, let's see here. Some other helpful ones. Let's see here. So something to keep in mind is if some of these are going to look better than others. So for instance, glass. I wouldn't don't don't mess with glass yet because there's um, there's some techniques I need to show you in order for it to look good. So for instance, if we were to make this a glass material right now, it's probably not. It's, it's going to look pretty um, cruddy right there. You know, that's not, that's not great. And um, the reason for that, and I'm going to show this, is if you think about a glass, it's two-sided, right? So it needs something to refract. And right now, this is a donut without an inside to it. So there's nothing to refract inside of there. So it just looks fake and weird and dumb in there. So um, at this stage, I would stay away from the glass and the transparent objects, because there's some stuff I need to show you before you can kind of get that looking good. But um, you know, there's some other ones that can be uh, useful in here. Again, I'm kind of sticking with the reflective ones for right now, like gold's looking okay. 
Um, but so you can see I use the studio um, HDRI and so you can see those studio lights reflecting into it. Let me um, quickly, let me just render this out. I'm going to take a snapshot of it right here. Oops. And so this was it before. That's it with the chrome object, or sorry, gold object right there. And one thing I want to show is what happens when you change out the sky dome light. So I'm going to select the um, sky dome in my outliner right here. Um, and then all you need to do to replace the color is you can do it in the hyper shade, um, but um, I don't want to throw too much at you here. So remember, we can kind of tab over to the file right here that's being used. And I can just click on that folder and I can choose a different interior right here. So I'm just going to choose um, the church interior. So we're going to end up with a different interior being projected onto the scene. And when I go back to my render view, this should, hypothetically, let's see, it's having to think about it. Um, should hypothetically look pretty different here. Um, so as this is thinking about it, within the hypershade, you're going to have to build yourself a library of materials, right? So you can't, um, uh, if you want a bunch of plastic objects that look like the same plastic, you'll need to kind of make a plastic, give it a color, duplicate it in the hypershade, and kind of make a new material for each color object that you want to use, um, at least in this instance. Um, okay, there we go. So you can see right here, we have the donut um, with a um, the church interior right here, and then we have the donut with the studio interior right there. So you can see, like, as we're kind of changing out these um, sky dome lights, things change pretty drastically right here. Um, one other thing that could be helpful is this donut. Um, that resolution is pretty good. I'm wondering how much better or worse it would look if it were smooth. I, I guess for today's demonstration, this is OK. But um, I can kind of see, it's hard to see right now. This is pretty good, but there's like a little bit of aliasing around the edges, or so, sorry, faceting around the edges. Um, and so we mentioned this before, and I want to kind of, um, now that I have a little bit better of a lighting scheme happening, I think it, become, it can become a little clearer here. And so I have this cube right here that has no bevel to it. And then I have this cube right here with a little bit of a bevel to it. And so having like a little bit of that bevel really does go a long way because again, we can, um, this to me looks way more realistic than if I had a series of these cubes that were just um, uh, had one face for each side, right? So if we look at this, this cube right here, it's got the bevel and the light's kind of able to catch it right here. And so pretty much no matter how thick or thin your object is, I would give it like some kind of bevel on there just, um, because we kind of want realistic looking renders here. And that helps out a lot with that right there. Um, so let me just show that particularly, and this is particularly the case with objects that are like, um, that are reflective like this one right here. So let me just kind of to further show that example, let me pull up the hyper shade real quick. I am going to make the donut the plain white one more time, just by selecting the donut in object mode, selecting it on the white, I'll assign material to selection. Now I'm going to select the two cubes in object mode, go over to the gold preset that I made, right click and assign material to selection. They'll appear black in the preview screen. And um, I haven't tested this out, so fingers crossed that I don't eat my own words here. Um, but you can see right here, yeah, that, that's right. So. Do you see on so particularly with objects, this is the case when you get into objects that have refraction, um, reflection, stuff like that. It really gets dialed up, the difference in realism. And again, I know this is a really grainy render that we're looking at here, but 
look at how much more realistic this cube right here looks with the bevel on the sides than this cube right here with no bevel on it. This this cube right here looks kind of kind of crap right here without any kind of um, light kind of um, adding specular highlights along the edges. So just to kind of hammer that home one more time is particularly when you have objects with reflectivity on them. Uh, this becomes more and more important right here to kind of model your objects correctly here. So um, this is how you begin to add, um, introduce color into your scene. So there's kind of two ways you can think about color here, which is you can add color into your scene um, through the objects. And let's just say with the donut again, I'll give it, I'll give each of these like a slightly different color. Okay, so I have a few different objects with uh, different colors on them. Um, so you can change the color this way um, and keep your lights white, which is usually kind of like the most standard way to do things. Um, and then you can start to kind of play with changing your light colors to, um, to kind of um, play with uh, color theory that way as well. Um, but usually the safest option is to keep your lights generally white or off-white and then change the color of your objects because that's the way it usually is in reality. Um, but let's say I take my area light. Um, oops. Right here, I'll press F to focus on it. It's a little hard to see right there. And remember, I can click on it here and give it a really drastic color right here. And so you can see how that kind of changes the tint of everything right there. Um, and you can kind of play your, with your scene this way. Um, but again, this, this gets pretty tricky. You know, this um, it kind of looks like for anyone who's um, worked with uh, cameras before, when you change the color of the light, unless you're very um, careful with how you do it um, and you have multiple lights doing multiple things, it can end up looking like you set the white balance on your camera wrong, right? It looks like this like looks like it's underwater right now rather than um, something like intentional right now. So um, in order to kind of make it look intentional, that's why I might need to create another light and um, begin to kind of build the scene out that way. Um, does anyone have any questions for me right now on how to, um, use the hypershade to kind of build a library of materials and um, create different color objects here. Um, yeah, just, I'll see it if you um, say anything in the chat right there. Um, okay, so um, let me, I'm gonna get rid of the Chrome here and Let's for fun bring up three point lighting here because I think three point lighting is a fun topic here. Um, okay, so I have right here my several objects. You know what? I'm just going to make everything white again, just so that we can focus on the lighting here and not get distracted. So sorry about this. So Arnold, I have everything selected with my white right here. I'm going to just right click on it, assign material to selection. So we're kind of right back to the, the default right here. Um, before I go into three-point lighting, uh, one thing I'd like to say on this is that um, I, when you select a material in the hypershade, um, keep in mind that there's the presets, which again is this button right here when you're choosing a material and you can kind of choose that list of presets. But um, I'm gonna dive into this more and more as the semester goes along, but go ahead and just start messing around with this. Like um, the base color right here is gonna be um, the fundamental color of your object right here in this first menu. And they do a good job of dividing this out in the category right here. So specularity, a specular highlight is the white highlight that shows up on um, like a plastic material. We'll have that white highlight on it. So that's um, what specularity is. 
So if you change the weight of it to zero, it's got no specularity right now. And you can see in this preview object what that is. So I bring it up so you can see that specularity. But you can see with the roughness slider, I can have it look um, very broad, what the specular highlights are doing. They're very broad. Or I can have it really sharp. And you can see right there, it's like becomes very highly reflective at that point in the preview. So I can change this object pretty drastically just with these first two menus right here. So um, it's still kind of within that realm of plastics by default, but I can change the base color right here to something like this. You can see in the, the preview, um, you can change the metalness. So right here, that's a really good one to get used to. So the more I drag it up, the more metallic it's gonna look right here. So now we're already moving outside of the realm of plastics into metals right here, especially if I change this back to um, a chrome color right there. So instead of doing the chrome preset, I was able to create a chrome material right here just by moving two sliders real quick. Does that make sense? So um, let me bring this back to where it was initially. So I think it was around here by default. So this is the AI standard surface when you just open it up by default. and so again, I can change the material by going up to presets and go up to Chrome and then choose Chrome. And I'm going to end up with a Chrome material like that. But I can do the same thing by learning and knowing how to manipulate these sliders. So in the end, you, you get a little further, right? Knowing what these sliders do and kind of getting a full understanding of them. And you can see there's a whole list of them, like transmission, which is the transparency, and subsurface, which is a whole other thing we'll get into down the road. But with just these first two menus, I can bring this from a plastic, just um, and just by moving this me um, metalness slider up right here, which is at the bottom of the base material, we're kind of already most of the way there. But the reflections or the specular highlights are still, um, or sorry, the reflections are still a little um, broad right here. And so now all I need to do in the specularity is just take the roughness because the specular highlights are really rough right there. And I just bring them to something sharper. And right there, got a chrome material on my hands just by moving two sliders right there. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of adjust this here. Um, and when we get into texturing, that's going to be a whole other level of things that you're able to unlock in this, in this realm right here. Um, so when we get to texturing, there's going to be a whole le other level of like, you'll level up in terms of like things that you can do with your scenes here. So anyway, um, tangent over, let's see here. Um, I'll bring this back to where it was, which was somewhere around here. Okay, so this is the scene, okay. It's having to kind of catch up with me again. Um, OK, so creating a three-point lighting scheme. If you look on the uh, D2L up here, if you look under week three, which is where we are, we have the YouTube tutorial, which um, kind of goes over. This YouTube tutorial goes over a lot of what I talked about today and on Tuesday. Um, I think for the final rendering, I might have used um, the old school render view a little bit. They both work, but um, anyway, that might be the one difference between that and what you saw this week. Um, then we have this handout right here. So it's called the three-point lighting handout. And again, I, I want to emphasize again that you guys can um, use one light in your scene and do great. Um, and especially early on, I even kind of encourage that. Just the skydome light, one light, at one area light, and then you're kind of good to go. Let's see, this is a pairing blank. I might need to download it. Um, oh, weird. Why is it doing that? Um, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, shoot. I'll re-upload this um, after the lecture here. Um, I forgot to export it as a PDF here. So um, essentially what you're doing with a three-point light here is what I've been showing you is how to what is called key lighting. And key lighting is where you just create one light 
And as you're seeing, and you can see right here in this image at the bottom, a key light can look awesome in a scene. Um, and what three point lighting is, is you're setting up three lights in your scene to make the object look more and more three dimensional. Um, again, for this project, if you're not comfortable with this, I again, feel, feel it's okay to feel fine ignoring what I'm saying here on this. But you can see right here, you add, you introduce um, the key light is that first light that we made and it's doing um, most of the work in the scene. And then as you introduce what's called a rim light, you're introducing the second light right here, which is creating highlights along the side. Um, so you can see right here along this person's neck on the left side right here, you can see this highlight showing up right here where it's not showing up there before. And you can see this highlight forming right here, um, where it's not forming right there. And it's not better or worse, right? Um, neither of these pictures is better and worse than the other. What that that uh, rim light is doing is it's help making um, the character look more three-dimensional. Di three so depending on what you're trying to do with your scene, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and then finally, there's the fill light, which can also be called backlighting. And you put a light behind your subject, just all the way behind them, and it creates, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Sorry, the rim light is behind them right here. And then the fill light is um, about uh, 70 degrees off from your key light. And it's kind of aiming up, filling in this, what the, this area in here where it's kind of cast in shadow um, under the chin is making that a little more three-dimensional right here. So um, typically, if you're doing a, a, a three-point lighting scheme, and this is true in real life or virtually here, is imagine the key light is 100% bright, um, and that's your main light. Um, typically, your rim light and your fill light may, might be if your key light is at 100%. Um, these might be at like 50% or 20%, something like that. They're way less powerful. They're doing a lot less in the scene, but they're just helping kind of fill out your, your scene a little bit more. So again, that first light that you create, spend a lot of time setting that up and getting it just right. And then if you feel like your um, the lighting in your scene just needs a little more juice, you can add two more lights in your scene to um, help give it a little more three dimensionality to it. And these are just, they're kind of, um, again, they're just, they're help, they're kind of helpers in this situation here. So a typical three-point lighting scheme, if we're looking at the subject from overhead, so imagine this, this is a person right here, and this is the camera right here, and the person is facing towards the camera. The key light is the main light. You can think of it as the main light, and it's doing most of the work, which you're seeing right there. And then you have what's called um, the rim light, which is coming behind the character. And again, it's kind of just, it's doing something really subtle where it's just creating these little highlights along the side. And then you're creating this fill light, which is just kind of helping fill in a little bit of extra area right here. Um, so let me demonstrate this real quick. And again, like looking at these renders right here, like for instance, this render right here, I don't know if this needs three-point lighting. You know, like sometimes if you're looking at like a Rembrandt or something like that, there's light pouring in from one window and that's it, right? Um, so again, I don't want to oversell a three-point lighting is better than this, this other form of lighting right here. But um, if you want to do three-point lighting, so this is our main light right here. Oops. Press focus on that. So we have our main light right here. And then if you look at the graph um, that I have pulled up here, oh my gosh, that I have pulled up here, um, the next light you might want to do is the fill light. And you can see it's a much less powerful light. And if the, the key light is set at this angle, it might be just kind of um, filling in the shadow that um, a little bit there. And you can take this graph and you can flip it. So the, the key light can be on the right side or the left side. And it's just, you have to change the lights correspondingly. So if the key light's on the left and the fill's on the, um, then the fill's on the right. If the key light's on the right, then the fill's on the left. That's, that's all there really is to it. And you're just triangulating your scene a little bit here. Um, so for the, 
I've got my key light right here. And if I want to make a fill light, I could either go up to um, Arnold uh, lights and make another area light right here. Or I can just let me rename this as my key light. And I can duplicate it right here just by pressing Command and D on my key light. And you can see it makes a duplicate right there in my outliner. I can call this fill. And with the fill selected, I can just move it over. And this is where the orthographic view can be really helpful too. So I can um, press this button right here to, so I can look at this from the top. So remember the key light right here is pointing right there. And so for the fill, the point of the fill right here is to help fill in some of these shadows a little bit more. Um, so with the fill, I'll just kind of rotate it around a little bit. I probably should have made a new light for this. Um, it's a little, a little bit much. I might bring it a little closer to the scene. Again, the main goal of this thing is to fill in the shadows. And it can be helpful to kind of just set up your render in real time as you're doing this. Um, and a real interesting tip that I do when setting up um, three-point lighting schemes is I'll actually give my lights really um, bright color, or sorry, um, I'll give them colors so I know what light is doing which. Because if, if each light is white, then it's hard to tell what light is pro providing what light. So for instance, I might select my key light right here, my main light. Oops. And then set the color to be blue like this. So I can see the blue is coming from that light. And then I might set my fill light. And I'll change these colors later. This is just so I can see what I'm doing. Um, and I might set my fill light to be fuchsia. And we're kind of already ending up with like a kind of a cool situation right here just by um, creating like a blue light and a fuchsia light right here. But again, the kind of the purpose of this is so that I can see, and it's hard with a one, it's really helpful to have two screens when working in Maya, having one screen, especially on a laptop, you find yourself juggling. Oh, no. these render views a lot here. Um, but I can select my fill and I can begin to see just by giving it that bright color, how much is contributing to the scene. So I might kind of dial it back a little bit and you can see the main goal of it right there is to just kind of fill in some of the shadow that was being cast before. So if I take the intensity all the way down to zero, this was the my scene with just one light in it. And then I'll dial up the intensity of my fill light right here. And you can see that it's beginning to kind of fill in those shadows right there. So I'll do snapshots again to help illustrate this. So we got our first view right here. Then I'll kind of dial up my fill light a little bit right here. I'll give it a little more juice. And again, if both of these lights were white, it would be a little hard for me to see the difference between what light is doing what here, right? So um, I'm going to just let this render for one second, just so we can see this a little more clearly. Um, OK, that's good enough. So I'll snapshot that. And again, I'm snapshotting by pressing this button right here. So we got our we got our one light. Then we got our fill light situation. And um, we can see my psych is starting to kind of catch some of that fill light right there. So if that's happening in your scene and you find it distracting in your scene, one thing you can do is you can just make your psych bigger. Um, so in this scene right here, what I might do is just select my psych. I can scale it up and then move it away. We'll see if this updates. Oops, moved it too far away. Um, there we go. So you can see just by making my psych bigger, 
that lights, you know, it's kind of moving away. And so that wall isn't catching that, that, um, that fuchsia light anymore right there. Um, and so again, you can see how much, like I spent most of my time setting up my main light. And this is just a stylistic decision, right? For three point lighting where I can set up my second light and set it up as a fill. And again, I like to use color so I can use, see what these lights are doing. And just to kind of finish out the, the lighting scheme, um, setting up a rim light right here is gonna be a little tricky, but what I'll do for the rim light, and again, the rim light is the light that's coming behind the scene so that you can, um, and I'll just catch, this only job is to catch little highlights right here on the edges. That's what you're kind of trying to do with a rim light. And so I will go to Arnold lights, create one more area light and press W so that I can reposition it. It is facing to our left. I need to give it more intensity. I'll give it a thousand. So you can see that light starting to come in. I'm gonna give it another bright color just so I can continue to see what's doing what here. What looks good here? Um, I don't know. Let's see. I'll do that. So it's going to be like more of like a, oops. It's going to be a highly saturated orange right here. And this one's going to be tricky. Let's see here. Let's say, for instance, that just on this platonic solid, I want a little bit of a highlight happening here. So what I'm going to do is set this up. And the room light's always just really tricky to get it right. Um, I have a trick that I usually use to um, get it so that it's not interfering with my psych right here. And that's that's the real difficult part with the rim light right here. Um, Cause you can see it's hitting the floor right there. And there's actually something I can do to make it so that it's not the light only affects the objects that I want it to affect, which is um, can be really fun, but um, I don't wanna, I've already thrown like a thousand things at you all today. So I'm trying to not make your life more difficult than it needs to be right here. Um, so you can see right here with the rim light, I'm starting to kind of get it back there, but it's kind of affecting the rest of the scene. So that's something you might have to look out for a little bit with the rim light. You know, sometimes just using something that's way less powerful in there um, can be helpful. And so you can see I dialed the intensity way down and it's just creating that little highlight that we can see right there. Um, and I'll just take a snapshot of it. And so the rim light, I could do a little bit better here, but I'm just trying to give the idea here. So we have our key light right here. It's doing most of the work right here. I'm doing the, the fill light. And then right here, not perfect, but it's at least the right idea where I'm trying to set in a rim light to just give like a little bit of rim lighting to the situation. So looking back at the um, the example right here, this is actually a really excellent example right here of the three in use. And again, I don't feel like it, um, any of these are better than the other. It's just I'm trying to give you guys um, tools and vocabulary on how you set up your lighting. Um, you can see this key light photo looks great. You can just set up a key light and a rim light. So you can just have two lights in your scene along with your sky dome and end up with something that looks really cool here. And you can see here when you kind of put them all three in concert with one another, you can get something that looks kind of like the most three dimensional, but it's, it, it takes a little bit of work, um, actually a lot of work to kind of get them positioned just right right here. And so again, this graph right here gives like a pretty good um, diagram of how it should look from overhead. Um, but there's a lot of very you can you can kind of change this up if you want. So this 
Um, this rim light doesn't need to be facing directly back at the key light. It's basically the rim light can be anywhere behind your subject. And again, its goal is just to um, get that little highlight going along there along the edge. Um, but there's also different forms of three-point lighting right here. So for instance, um, this image right here is another example of three-point lighting where we have two rim lights, so two backlights behind the character, creating these really bright highlights right here that are going along the silhouette. And then the key light's job in this situation is just to give a little bit of light so that the face isn't in complete darkness right there. Um, so I kind of give, give both of these examples because I kind of want to demonstrate that um, three-point lighting is a broad term. And um, essentially, it's where you have a light in front of your subject, a light behind your subject, and then you have some kind of light accompanying it to help kind of fill in um, uh, the shadows. So that um, usually in three-point lighting, nothing's in complete shadow. Like every aspect is lit to some degree, like you see in here. Um, and it just helps three um, helps your image look a little more three dimensional. Um, so uh, right here, that room light being white is um, or bright yellow is really bothering me. So I'm just going to bring that back to more normal color and just make it really subtle back here, just so the room light's just only doing a little bit right there. And so if we look at the scene again from the top. And I'm going to hide my render view. We have um, we have our objects right here. This is the key light right here. This is the fill light right here. And then this is our rim light or our backlight right there. So you can see how it's triangulating the scene a little bit. Um, this light, the key light, is way brighter than my other lights. It's doing, again, most of the lifting here, my main light. And then these other two lights are just kind of um, uh, they're accompanying it. They're just kind of giving little, uh, adding a little touch to it. So um, again, when setting up your scene, um, again, the most common mistake I see um, with students is they'll just start filling up their scene with like a bunch of different lights um, without um, being careful um, with how they set up um, what each one's purpose is. And um, it can get real, um, it can get clogged up real quick. And a lot of the times I've seen students um, set up a light and think, oh, that's not doing very much because the intensity wasn't high enough over here. And then they would, before making adjustments to it to give it that first light enough brightness to kind of do its job, they'll start adding other lights and end up with like six or seven lights that, and none of those six or seven lights are really bringing that much to the table. Um, and then the scene can get a little clogged up. Um, one thing to remember is with each light that you add to your scene, your render time is going to go up. So um, if you keep your lighting to just the sky dome light and one area light, your, your renders are going to go quicker. And with each light that you add to your scene, your renders will just kind of get a little bit more you know, they'll get clogged up just like a little bit more and a little bit more as you keep adding them here. So especially for this project that we're working on right now, if you want to just do a sky dome and one area light, that's totally fine by me. Um, you're, you're not going to get a bad grade for doing that. Um, and um, if you start adding more lights, I would recommend that you, you take into consideration this kind of three-point lighting scheme theory. And um, just add, um, if you're going to use more than just that one area light to kind of um, think about the purpose of each light as you're adding it into the scene and um, taking into consideration um, the three-point lighting kind of system. Um, just like any system in artistic life, you know, rules are there because they kind of give you a fun guardrail that can end up with really um, with a really nice product, but you know rules are meant to be broken, so um, kind of keep that in mind. But um, I would just kind of go back and say like really really try to not have more than three lights in your scene because um, it's it, it's going to get real hairy on you. So um, I 
just kind of for your own mental guidance, guidance, I would give yourself a, a maximum of of three lights um, beyond your sky dome light, and I would give yourself a minimum of your sky dome light in one area light. You know, if you fall somewhere in that range, I think you can end up with something really good. And um, again, just kind of set up one light at a time. Make sure that they have enough brightness. Remember that I had this um, when you create a light. Um, the most common thing that I see that trips people up. I'm just going to delete out my additional lights right here and just keep only my key light right here. Is the most common mistake I see with people who are new to Maya is they'll create their first light. You remember it's set by at one right here, and so when you have your light set at one, it's not contributing anything to your scene. It's not enough. Um, it is enough with a sky dome, but again, with an area light, it's not enough. Um, so the only light that's happening, get, being contributed to my render right now is my sky dome is the only thing really providing light right here. This with the area lights is not providing a meaningful amount of light until you get into the hundreds and then usually into the thousands. So when I type in 2000 right there, um, I'm also working with a small scene. It's, you know, beginning to be enough right there. Um, one last note that I want to give on this is remember just to kind of review some of the things that we talked about today is with an area light, you have um, the intensity, you have the color slider, but then you also have the spread slider. And those are kind of the main sliders I want you all to make mess with. But if I have the spread set to one, it's a really nice light. I actually really like it's set to one right here and it usually looks super nice and it's very gradual and it's um, light fall off, but you just might need a little more intensity in it to kind of get it up, up to where you need it. So you see how like 2,500 is just barely enough. And as I take that spread down and I kind of narrow this into a beam, do you see how things start to get really blown out where they weren't blown out before? So, so it's not blown out with the spread all the way up. And then when I take the spread in, it starts to get blown out in there. So just try to be careful, be cognizant not to blow out any areas in your scene. You want um, the areas that show up as white in your renders. If it looks like that, that's not a um, that's not a good render right there. That's it's, um, it's just kind of like a blown out image right there. And so just kind of be careful to kind of adjust these sliders. And again, the main ones you're messing with when dealing with an area light is intensity and spread right here. And just kind of counterbalance them so that you end up with a nicely evenly lit render right there. Um, so looking through our renders today, I'll take one last snapshot right here just to kind of review what we've talked about today is we started off with the sky dome light right here, which is what we talked about um, on Tuesday, where you, you create a light in a sky dome that projects in every direction. And it, it provides a nice baseline for you. And it makes it so when you create when, later on, if you decide to create reflective objects, there's something to reflect in there. Um, without a sky dome light, this um, chrome uh, donut's not going to look like anything because it, it, it won't have anything to reflect back at us. Oops. Oh, gosh. What just happened? Um, let's see here. And, oh man. Huh, let's see. Okay, there we go. I press, if that ever happens to you, press F up here. Um, my image just kind of went away on me there. So here I started creating just one area light. And remember you create an area light by going to Arnold lights and then area light right there. And that's the pretty much the main light you want to kind of mess around with experimenting because it's so versatile here. And so that was it at, kind of at a default. Remember, I had to set it to a large number before it started doing anything. This is it with the spread all the way up right here, the snapshot right here. Going through my snapshots through today. Um, that's the same picture. Um, oh, right. So remember with the area light with it um, when it's small, um, small in size, meaning I scaled it to be small, it's going to cast a hard shadow like this. And then if you scale it up so that it's larger, it's going to create a softer um, shadow like that. You can give it color right there. So that's just the white objects with the sky dome light. 
And then here in these renders right here, that's where I did the spread. So that's what the spread slider is doing is it's narrowing the light beams. And it's like the barn doors on a, on a photo, um, sorry, on a light and photography. And remember one of the main things that I talked about today was, and I guess I didn't keep too many renders of it right here, is in the hypershade, how you um, give yourself, um, create, keep creating materials. So you go to the hypershade by clicking on this button right here, and you can give yourself a library of materials. And remember it's Arnold shader and then the um, AI standard surface. And you can choose between giving yourself presets that are based off of these, and you can experiment with what those look like right there. Or you can just kind of change the color right here and change colors main or change parameters manual manually here. And remember to assign a material to any selected object. Um, you just select the object in object mode, then go up to the material. You right click the material and go to assign material to selection. You can see it updates right there. Um, and then beyond that, um, those are kind of the main technical things I want you all to know today. And then beyond that, I kind of just, I wanted to introduce the three point lighting idea. So you can see with one light, you can create really nice renders right here. So this is just um, a sky dome and one light. And I really like the way this render looks right here. Um, but if you want to fill in those shadows a little bit, because those shadows are really dark in there, you can start doing three point lighting. And again, remember, I made these lights. I mean, it looks cool stylized with these bright colors right here. So you can kind of go with that. But the main reason that I made these, these different colors is so you can see what each light is doing, right? So with the, this three-point lighting scheme, I set it up so that the, the main key light was blue. Um, the, the fill light was kind of this fuchsia color. And then the rim light was this more orange color. So you can kind of see what each one's role is right there. Um, and that kind of brings us back to this point right here. So it's kind of, I, I threw kind of three major things at you here today. Um, and if you're having trouble with them, just let me know. Uh, definitely try them out on your own. Remember, there's a video tutorial up. There's that link under week three that goes over pretty much all of this right in that tutorial. So you can kind of review that. Um, but I went over the um, shaders, how you can change out shaders here. The, um, the area light, and then try to introduce at least the concept of three-point lighting. And I'll re-upload that as a PDF onto the D2L so you all can look at that handout if you would like. Um, does anyone, so we're starting to kind of run out of time a little bit here. Um, does anyone, I, and that's kind of the end of my lecture right there. Does anyone have any questions for me? Did I go too fast or too slow over this material right here? You feel free to use the chat if you don't want to use the mic. That's no problem. Um, okay. Let's see, I'm not hearing from anybody, but um, hopefully y'all are doing okay. Um, let's see here. So um, remember, the, so this this project. We essentially have, especially with what we went over today, you have all the information you need to complete the assignment now. Um, the only piece that's missing right now in terms of information that you need um, to complete this assignment is I, I need to show you all still how to kind of get the graininess out of the renders. And that's it. So that's the only thing that's kind of missing right here. Because on this assignment, remember, you're setting up a scene with some primitives in it that can look something like this. I mean, please feel free to make something more complicated than what I have here. Um, and I, I'd like you all to kind of experiment with it, um, at least some different colors on the materials, you know? So I would like to see for the final render, um, not something like this um, where it's just kind of one color throughout, but, um, oh shoot, I didn't save any of my renders that um, where, there's like different colors kind of being implemented, right? We're looking at, um, you can kind of look back at um, the assignment. Um, uh, sorry. 
So remember the assignment examples right here where you're kind of giving the objects different colors right here. And again, you don't need to make things like this complicated. I'm just, again, showing you examples right here, but it's just primitive objects that you're staging into a scene um, and trying to create like a coherent um, uh, composition and lighting situation um, using the primitives here. And you can like this render right here, they're using the same kind of plasticky material for each of these objects, but they're just giving it a different color. So you could hypothetically just make one AI standard surface and duplicate it, giving it you know a couple of different colors and think about um, uh, just color and composition and lighting in the situation right here. So this is a pretty simple assignment when you get down to it, right? So you're just creating some primitives, putting it in the scene. You can see they're implementing the psych really nicely in some of these. This one has a hard wall right there. So you can see the difference between a psych and then a hard wall right there. So if you want the hard wall to make compositionally a hard line through there, that you can do that. There's even lighting through these. And um, again, the last thing which I will show on Tuesday's class is just um, how to get your renders into a good um, situation where they're, they're less grainy than what we have here. As you can see, these renders are still a little bit grainy in there. Um, any questions for me right now? I know today was a lot. Um, are y'all are y'all able to hear me right now? Okay. <laughs> um, gotcha. Um, okay. So, um, and one thing here is, so I'm, I'm, I'm. So I recorded this, um, the second part of this lecture. I'm so mad at myself. I forgot to record the first part where I went over the area light. Um, but I recorded this lecture, the second part of this lecture. So, um, and I'll upload that. So you'll be able to review that. And I'll actually just do that right after class here. Um, and uh, I am, I'm traveling a lot this coming weekend, but I'm gonna do my best to um, be checking email and all that. So if you have any questions for me, just um, send me an email and I'll do my best to um, get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but remember um, over the weekend, the, the assignment's starting to come up on us a little bit. So try um, in your project, start staging your scene a little bit, you know, and um, remember all you have to do is work with primitives here and, um, just try to make progress and send me emails on, on your work. And on Tuesday's class, um, I'm just, my demo is going to be way short. My lecture is going to be way shorter than what I did today. Um, it's going to be pretty brief. And my lecture is just going to be on how to get the graininess out of your renders and how to export your renders. And that's going to be it. Um, and so hopefully there will be um, a good amount of time on Tuesday's class for me to kind of go around and help you, help you all out for Thursday's final deadline on the project. Um, okay, so um, uh, with that said, um, I, I'll I'll just I'll go ahead and dismiss class, and I will stay around for um, a few more minutes here. Um, so feel free to log off. But if um, you have any questions for me or anything like that that you'd like answered um, right now, I'll stay online here for um, um, the remainder here. So uh, have a good weekend, everybody, and. Just um, stick around if you have any questions for me, OK? All right, thanks, y'all. Have a good weekend.